In this video, we're going to attempt a final exam paper from Tamasic Polytechnic. This involves, of course, a mathematics paper, and this involves three topics. Differential equations, Laplace transforms, and Fourier series. Now this paper is split up into two portions. The first portion, which consists of relatively easy questions, comprises 48 marks. And the last four questions, which are significantly more challenging, uh, comprises of 52 marks. We're going to attempt all of these questions, and we are going to spend enough time on each of these questions. I'm not going to solve everything within two hours. I might, but that's not really uh, in my plan when doing this video. The plan is to cover each of these questions with sufficiently clear understanding that you guys will be able to follow along. Without further ado, let's go on to our first question. For our first question, we want to solve the separable differential equation that looks a bit like this. Roughly speaking, a separable differential equation takes on the form of dy over dx equals to f of x divided by g of y. As the name suggests, we want to separate the x's and the y's. And that's why we're going to do a quick cross multiplication in this direction like this. And the idea is that these two expressions ought to be equal to each other. Now, strictly speaking, this is not really a well-defined notion, but once you add in the integral symbols, nobody is going to debate as to whether what you're writing is legitimate or not. Now, in this context, we could, in fact, make a very similar calculation, and we can multiply the cosines up like this, and the dx up like this. What that means is that we can integrate on both sides. And when we do the simplification, we should be able to obtain the correct answer. On the left side, we are integrating cosine. And that is going to simply be sine of y. On the left side, we are going to integrate x followed by ex, and we can do the integration separately because integration is a linear transformation. Now what that means is that if we integrate x, we're going to get x squared over 2. And when we integrate e to the x, we're going to get e to the x. We add them together and of course conclude with the arbitrary constant of integration. That's how we deal with a separable differential equation. We separate the variables and apply some integration. To be fair, the integration portion can get tricky because we can throw in some integration of by parts or by substitution. So feel free to revise those ideas uh, if you wish. Let me know if you want a video on those in the comment section below. On that same topic, we're going to solve a linear differential equation. It looks just like the separable equation, but it looks similar, but isn't exactly the same, and we're going to use a different technique. More precisely, we do have a general formula to solve this problem. Whenever we're given a differential equation of this form, we can solve it as long as we have uh, two components. Well, three components, but we'll see how it works. The solution is given by ix times y equals to the integral of ix times q of x. You might be wondering what on earth this ix is. It's what we call an integrating factor. And more precisely, ix is given by the exponential of the integral of px. Yes, this px is in fact the same px as this thing over here. 
So the idea is that once we can identify Px, we can obtain our integrating factor and then plug it into this formula, perhaps do some integration over here, and then work out our answer. In this context, we are given this particular differential equation. Whoops. And the p in this context is going to be negative 2. This is going to be our px, which means that the integrating factor is going to be the exponential of the integral of px. Well, what is px? Well, we've just highlighted that px is in fact negative 2. So we can substitute that with negative 2, like this. Let's do some integration. And normally, well, we integrate a constant to get constant times x. Normally, we need to add a plus c, but when we do the calculations carefully, it turns out that the plus c uh, would not be necessary. It's not wrong. You can include it if you want. It sort of cancels out at the very end. So to save space and to save sanity, let's just avoid putting the plus c. Uh, let me know if I'm going to do a video showing why the plus c is actually not so necessary. The point is, now that we have ix, we could plug that into this expression over here. And so we get y times ix equals the integral of ix times qx dx. ix over here is an abbreviation. This is the same ix we calculated. E this equals e to the minus 2x. And we can make the substitution. Well, what is qx? qx is anything on the right-hand side, which is just in terms of x. There is no y's, no nothing. And we have e to the 2x as our q of x. What that means is that on the left-hand side, nice things happen. Uh, these two things cancel out. We're left with the integral of 1 dx. This simplifies to x plus c. So in fact, this is our final answer. If you prefer, and you would like to make y the subject, there are no issues with that. You are free to do that if you want. If you want to leave your answer in what we call implicit form, this works out just as well. When it comes to solving differential equations, it usually takes a lot of effort to write y in terms of x. And we need to use some interesting pure math techniques uh, to justify why this presentation is a legitimate one. The next question involves a second order homogeneous differential equation. We get the term second order because we're involving second derivatives. And we call this a homogeneous equation because the right hand side is zero. Now what that looks like is a rather standard technique that can be justified, but we're not going to do that in this video. Once again, let me know if you want to see the proof in the comment section below. Now, um, the standard technique we go about solving this equation is to write this in terms of what we call its characteristic equation. And what this looks like is converting the derivatives into m's. More precisely, the second derivative will become m squared. The first derivative will become m. And the last term, there's no de the derivatives and whatnot, that just becomes the constant term 1. 
So what we do with this characteristic equation is to solve it to get m uh, minus uh, 4 all squared equals to 0. You could sort of mentally solve it if you wish. You could use your calculator. Whatever you want, as long as you can get m equals to 4. That's how we go about thinking about this question. Now, once we have m equals to 4, well, what kind of um, solutions are these? Well, this is a real solution. This is a real solution. And we only get one answer, which means it's what we call a repeated solution. It's sort of repeated because this is like m minus 4 times m minus 4. We do get two solutions, but they happen to be the same thing. So that's why we call this real and repeated. And when the roots are real and repeated, we have a standard formula for the solution. It looks like this. y equals to c1x plus c2 times e to the um, 4x. Now, there are a bunch of different permutations. So, for example, if you have two real roots that are distinct, and real, your solution is going to look like c1 e to the alpha x plus c2 e to the alpha, uh, well not alpha, sorry, uh, beta x. And if uh, p, or rather if p plus or minus um, jq, here um, j is the square root of minus 1, I understand that most math people use i in the context of engineering mathematics, at least in this context, we use j. In this case, we have um, complex conjugate roots. Then the solution is going to look like, is gonna look like e to the px times c1 sine, well, I think it's cosine actually. I believe it's cosine qx plus c2 sine qx, right? And of course, and of course, if it's repeated, then we work with this particular formula. Now we go on to Laplace transforms, and Laplace transforms follows what we call a Laplace transforms table. Uh, there's a very common table that's commonly used in most engineering courses, so check your institution for that. In this case, um, I'm just gonna write the Laplace transforms based on my memory. I can try to write the formulas on the side actually, just to keep everybody up to date. Now, the first thing that uh, catches my eye is the fact that L Laplace transforms are linear transformations. Here I'm going to use the square bracket notation. I understand that there are various kinds of notations, uh, but I'm using the square bracket notation. Oops. I believe there are notations that look a bit like this. And of course, that depends on the convention you are using. Now, using the Laplace transform table, we could actually write down each of these answers. So let me highlight what we're using. For the first one, we're using the fact that the Laplace transform of 1 is just 1 over s. That's a rather standard result. And the second one is similar. However, it looks a bit like this. So let's just draw a mini Laplace table here. On the left side, we have t to the n. On the right side, we have n factorial over t to the n plus 1. Here, n can be any non-negative integer. In this context, we're going to use n equals to, well, 2. So let's contextualize that. Oops, let's write it all in white. And for exponentials, we can write 
e to the plus of e to the a t as 1 over s minus a. Which means that we can write this as 1 over s minus 3. All that remains is to simplify this expression. And we are done. That's the answer. So the idea is that we first use the fact that the Laplace transform is a linear transformation, and then we apply the sequence of results. It's very similar to differentiation and integration whenever you're given the derivative and integral pairs in a table. The opposite of Laplace transforms is Laplace inverses. And so that's what we'll be doing in this part. We're going to take the Laplace inverse of this expression. Just like before, the Laplace inverse is a linear transformation. So we can do some splitting. I have a video on linear transformations. You can go check that out somewhere in the channel. I might leave a link somewhere for that. Now, to handle these guys, we're going to need the Laplace inverse tables. So let me just write out a quick demonstration of the pairs that we're going to need in this expression. Here, I'm going to let the capital F denote the Laplace transform of small f. All right, so this is just notation to mean L of f of t. Okay. So the idea is we take the small letter, we Laplace it, it becomes a big letter. And we can write down some results which will be useful for, for, <laughs> for our purposes. For the first result, we actually get something that looks very similar to this. These things sort of pair up. In fact, if we let n equals to 1, we're going to get the exact same thing. Let me just write it down in this manner. These terms match up. I think I made a typo error. This should be the s over here. Let me check if I've made a typo error previously. Yes, I made a typo error over here as well. And what this means for us is that now we can actually do the Laplace transform. Now let's do that later. Let's just clean things up a bit. Now this last term over here actually looks really nice. It looks a lot like the cosine term with a equals to, well, the square root of 4 is 2. So we are going to do that. We're going to write this as s divided by s squared plus 2 squared. Let's close the brackets over there. We could do, do, uh, we could do a similar idea with this middle term. So there is a catch, there is a small catch here. The term on the bottom over here is 9, so that's s squared plus 3 squared. However, in order to use the sine pair, the numerator has to be a 3. So how do we fix this problem? Well, the idea is that 3 multiplied by 1 over 3 equals to 1. But since Laplace inverse is a linear transformation, this 1 over 3 can be legitimately pulled out. 
linear transformations allows you to pull out these scalar multiples. Which means now we can go ahead to use our Laplace tables. I told my students that this is known as the compensation technique. If you multiply a 3 on the top, you gotta compensate by dividing it on the outside. Feel free to use it if you wish. So the first term is going to become t. This is with n equals to 1. Uh, the second term is going to be sine of 3t, a equals to 3. And the last one is going to be cosine of 2t. For our final question, we need to evaluate the following inverse d operator, which has its own sets of rules. Now, this might look a little bit strange to some of you. Uh, you might be more familiar with the method of undetermined coefficients in order to help you solve differential equations. In some sense, this is sort of the consolidated version of a bunch of common functions being used. So feel free to use this to solve your differential equations if you wish. Uh, if you find this limited, feel free to use some other method as well. Nevertheless, we're going to use um, the inverse d table uh, in order to help us with this. I'm not going to use all the formulas in this discussion because I'm just going to use some of it just to get the ball rolling. So what we're going to do now is, well, just like the Laplace transform and just like the integration, just like differentiation, integration, Laplace transforms, the inverse d operator is once again a linear transformation which allows you to do splitting. And splitting is useful because splitting helps you break down the problem, problem into a bunch of constituent parts and you can solve them using the math table and a bunch of established results. Math people are very lazy. So we are going to do just that. And to do this, we are going to take our cues from the inverse d tables. Okay, so let's just write it this way. Suppose we have a function, let's call it f of uh, x, and then let's call this the inverse d operator. So this will look a bit like this. Uh, what's 1 over f of d of f of x? All right. So for constant terms, if my memory serves me right, for constant terms, what we do is replace d with the number 0. I replace d with the number 0, which looks a bit like this. And then we multiply it with 1. For exponentials, I believe the general case if my memory serves me right, is to replace d with the letter, well, I think in the materials we use the letter k, so I believe it should be um, this expression. If I recall correctly, I think I got it right. Now what that means is that in this context, um, we replace the d with the number 2. And for trigonometric terms, uh, we need to be a little bit uh, more uh, careful, right? I believe that if we take the inverse d operator of something that looks like this, let's use k just to indicate what we call the parameter.
if these two numbers match, then the result will be x times sine of kx all divided by 2. Again, the derivation is not so straightforward, but if you're curious, let me know in the comment section below. And what that does for us is helps us, it helps us um, write all of this with the contextualization k equals to 1. All that remains is a quick simplification. And what I like to do is to bring the fraction to the front of the expression purely for aesthetic, so it's not that big of a deal. And I made a typo error here. Uh, this should be a sign term as uh, according to our math table. And that is basically it. It's basically it. Oh, this should be a 2k. My bad. Yeah, we take the k multiplied by 2. Uh, if k goes to 1, then this is just 2. For our next question, we want to evaluate the for our next question we want to evaluate the inverse d operator of this rather long expression. It looks long, but it's not as strange as we might think. Now for the first part of our discussion, we're gonna observe that this expression is of the form, well, it's of the form exponential times something. And if it's exponential times something, we can in fact solve it. It is reasonable, it is doable. Uh, we do need to do a little bit of work. So what we need to do is to first bring out this particular term. Let's keep the entire fraction, but we're gonna copy the structure here. We need to mix one modification in order for everything to work out. So the idea is to bring out the exponential and keep the entire structure. Now what gets replaced in the structure? Well, if this number is minus 2, then we have a result that tells us we need to replace everything with d minus 2. We need to replace it with d minus 2. And the result is not as strange and convoluted as we might think. Um, let's just try to do the expansion over here. I'm gonna do the expansion hopefully in my head. Hopefully I can do this right. Otherwise that'll be really awkward and embarrassing. I believe this is going to be d squared um, plus minus 4d plus 4d that cancels out plus 4 minus you know what? Let's just let's just let's just let's just um, let's just do this manually. Let's just open this up in a rather straightforward manner. So for the first expression, I expanded the common identity. For the second second expression, I did I just distributed the four into the terms. Your rainbow method, same thing, and the constant remains constant. Now the 4d's here would cancel out and what we have here is still a cosine of x. What remains is 1 divided by d squared minus 9 of cosine of x. And we can in fact use yet another result to help us. It turns out that as long as this is negative, we do have a way to calculate uh, the expression. Perhaps I'll write the formula somewhere on the top. So 1 divided by f of d of cosine of kx is 1 over f of minus k squared cosine kx if, it's a big condition, it's a really important condition, if f of minus k squared is non-zero. If it's zero, we have to use the result that we've actually seen earlier on. Now what that means is that 
In this context, k equals to 1, and when we do replace my d squared with minus of 1 squared, let's just try that out over here, the negative of 1 squared, it doesn't give us a zero denominator, which means we can carry out this calculation. This would simplify to negative 1 over 10, e to the minus 2x, cosine, of x. That is the result. That is how we compute this expression. Using this expression, which I'm going to write down over here, 1 over d squared plus 4d minus 5 of e to the minus 2x cosine of x. I'm going to write that expression here because this is going to help us with the next part, we need to solve this differential equation. And this is what we call a non-homogeneous equation because the right-hand side is non-zero. It's, if it's zero, we call it the homogeneous equation. It's actually linked to linear algebra. So let me know if you want me to do a little bit of nerding out on that. And this is what we call a non-homogeneous equation. Now, the general technique is to solve this in two parts. Our general solution is made out of two components, our particular integral and our complementary function. I'm going to give some space here because this will be our final answer. But let's start off with the particular integral. Let's start off with yp. So for yp, the trick is to first write all of this using inverse d notation. And one way to do that is to first write this as d squared y. This means you differentiate y two times. dy, this means you differentiate y once. And finally, minus 5y. While it looks a little hand wavy and unjustified, we actually can, using proper notation, factor the y. The caveat here is that the factorization must appear on the right side, otherwise this does not make any sense. yp, by definition, is the inverse d operator, whoops, is the inverse d operator of this expression. And you would probably observe that I did this first because that is precisely what we have previously calculated. Which means we can write out the answer as from part 1. And that is literally the first part of our answer. Well, if that's yp, what is yc? Well, yc is given by solving the homogeneous differential equation. It's rather remarkable that you can get all of the solutions just by doing these two parts. Sounds a bit strange, but it's true. And the justification comes from linear algebra <laughs> once again. So that's, that's, that's low-key pretty comical, I have to, I have to say. Now, how do we solve this equation? Let's first write the characteristic equation. And we're going to solve this characteristic equation. And after solving this equation, we observe that these are what we call real and distinct roots which means that our complementary function is going to be c1 e to the x plus c2 e to the minus 5x. That is going to be over here. And that is the general solution to our differential equation. It's made out of two parts your particular integral, and then your complementary function. If 
for this question, we want to calculate f of t in terms of unit step functions, which look a bit like u of t minus a. Right, so we do have a really cool technique to calculate this. The idea is to start from your base value. Let me try that again. The idea is to start from your base value. That looks horrible. Um, the idea is to start from your base value. So that is, well, it's going to be zero. And then jump. Take note of the jump. Well, how much did I jump by? I jumped by one unit. At what time did I jump? Well, I jumped at the time one. What that means is that we add one unit at the time one. Notice that I purposely used different colors to emphasize that these numbers are not derived using the same object. They are derived, the green term is derived by the jump and the yellow term is derived by the time at which the jump occurs. Rinse and repeat. We do the same thing at time two. Jump over here, well, it's three units, and we jump at time two. So three times the unit of time two. And finally, in this um, point, <laughs> in this part over here, we are subtracting by two units. So we will jump by negative two units at time five. All that remains is a quick simplification and we are actually going to need this for the second part of the question. For part B, whoops. For part B, we need to evaluate this particular Laplace transform, and this is what we call the shift theorems. This is one of the shift theorems. It tells us that if we multiply the exponential, then we take the Laplace transform. The result is if we first took the Laplace transform and shifted the result by k or a or whatever you call the parameter in this case. That's just Three. I took the three from this guy over here. But that raises the question, what on earth is f of s? Before we can take f of s minus three, we need to first calculate f of s. Well, that is just the Laplace transform of f of t. And we've already calculated what f of t is. This is the plus of these step functions. Once again, the Laplace transform is a linear transformation. And to take the Laplace transform if of a unit step function, we will take the exponential at the time divided by s, rinse and repeat. I missed an, an important detail. There should be a negative symbol. I, I'm not using the math table for this exercise. Now, with that, we can replace all of these s's with s minus 3's, and that's our answer. That 
is in fact our Laplace transform. Now this is actually somewhat interesting because this last question here takes well, it takes a little bit of effort. It's not so straightforward as it seems, but it's not as crazy as it seems as well. So we want to evaluate this particular Laplace. Well, whoops. We want to evaluate this particular Laplace transform and it looks horrible. But the first thing to do is to perhaps simplify what's on the inside over here. And what that looks like is, well, let's just think about 1 plus 2 times f of t. I'm going to do the algebra a little bit more quickly. And then we want to square this term. Now, to do multiplication, I actually have a video on multiplication. You can check it out somewhere on my channel once again. And the idea is to stack these guys into columns. So there are a few ideas at play here, but we're going to look at that one step at a time. Well, now, first thing I'm going to do is to first abbreviate all of these terms because it's a little clunky and it doesn't really help the calculation. So I'm going to first abbreviate each of these guys using u sub the time of that unit function. So in this case, it's u sub 1 because that's u of t minus 1. And then we'll take u sub 2, that's u of uh, t minus 2. And likewise, u of 5. We're going to stack these terms on the bottom and then we're going to stack it across the row. The rule that we need to apply in doing the multiplication is that whenever we multiply two unit step functions, we always get the larger of the two. Now, what that means is that, well, let's just fill out these and see how that works. Well, one multiplied by anything is just the same thing, so we can do a quick copying right there, and it works this way as well, because we're just getting 1 multiplied by all of that. So that's, that's not too crazy yet. Now when you multiply two step functions, if the time is the same, actually nothing really changes, so we could just multiply them accordingly. But interesting things happen when we multiply the unit step functions at different times. Well, 2 times 6, that's 12. But what's u1 times u2? u1 times u2 is, well, u of the bigger guy. In that case, that's 2 is bigger than 1. So the result here is 12u2. Well, what about this? Well, 4 minus 4u5 multiplied by 2u1. That is going to be minus 8u5 because 5 is bigger than 1. And you can rinse and repeat for the other results. So what do we get when we square all of these terms? Well, we're just going to add up each of these guys. Well, the constant term is just 1. The u sub 1 terms, there is a total of 8 of them, 2 plus 2 plus 4. So that's just 8 of u of t minus 1. Then we add up the u sub 2s. That is going to give us 24 plus, well, 36. That's going to be 72 u of t minus 2. And I don't even know how many this is. Let's see if I can do a quick calculation over here. I'm going to guess it's minus 56.
I'm going to guess it's minus 56. And then we can take the Laplace transforms, which is not as crazy as it seems. It's 1 over s plus 8e to the minus s over s plus 72e to the minus 2s over s minus 50, whoops, 56 e to the minus 5s over s. So it looks a little bit scrunchy, but this is in fact our Laplace transform. We multiply out the unit step functions, and then we apply the Laplace transform. It's not as crazy as it seems after doing this a few times. So um, practice makes pretty effort, right? The next question is to solve these Laplace transform well thingies. Um, well, well, there. Uh, we want to solve this initial value problem using Laplace transforms. In general, Laplace transforms make life relatively more straightforward, just in general. The idea is that the calculations simplify and you get something really nice. So let's go ahead to do Laplace transforms. Let's first take this equation and apply the Laplace transform on both sides. The first line of business is that the Laplace transform is linear. And we can try to calculate each of these things separately. Now, for the first term, this is what we call the Laplace transform of the second derivative. We actually have a really nice formula for that, which is built on the Laplace transform for the first derivative, but we'll worry about that later on. Uh, for the second derivative, we are getting this expression, s of capital Y of s minus... Oh, oops. Uh, my bad, s squared, capital Y of s, minus s of small y of 0, minus y prime of 0. And the Laplace of the first derivative is s times y of s, minus y of 0. And finally, the Laplace transform of the unit step function well, we've actually seen this just now. That is just e to the minus 2s divided by s. At this point in time, we need to make some observations. Uh, the most crucial observation is the fact that these guys equals to 0, which means that this term cancels out because that equals 0, and these two terms cancel out because that all equals to 0. What that means is that we are left with the sum of these three terms, which means that we are going to result in this expression. We can do a bit of factorization. And we can divide everything by this term. For reasons which will become more apparent, I'm going to bring the e to the minus 2s term over over here. Well, what's the beauty of this approach? Well, the idea is that we can recover the original function using this Laplace transform. What do I mean by that? Well, given y of s, we could go back to y of t. Well, how do we do that? Well, y of t is by definition the Laplace inverse of y of s. And what this looks like is, well, the Laplace inverse of this expression. Let's uh, bring this down here. Oops. Let's bring this down here and see what we can do with that. Now this looks rather suspect because 
this actually looks like Laplace inverse of the exponential multiplied by a function. And we know that whenever we do this, and you can refer this to one of the shift theorems in your Laplace tables once again, we have a nice formula for this. This is actually just f of t minus 2 multiplied by u of t minus 2. In other words, if we can get f of t minus 2, we can solve the question. What is f of t minus 2? Well, to get f of t minus 2, we are first going to need f of t. How do we get f of t? Well, f of t is the Laplace inverse of f of s, capital F of s to be more precise. And f of s, we have designated this function to represent this fraction over here, which means that the result is, well, let's just plug in the fraction. What we need to do now is what we call partial fractions. It's one of the more dreaded topics in uh, this course, but it's essential. It helps us actually calculate the Laplace inverse. Now, here's how I would go about doing partial fractions. Now, I notice that this denominator is made out of two parts, a quadratic term and a linear term. So we're going to split that up accordingly. For the quadratic term, the highest power is 2. So the numerator has the highest power of 1. And of course, you have the terms that's smaller than that. For the second term, the denominator has a highest power of 1. And so I'm going to just write that as a C. At this point in time, I'm actually not going to find A, B, and C first because I actually do want to finish up the Laplace transform. So let's first do a bit of simplifications. And using the fact that Laplace inverse is linear, I can write this as A times T plus b times, well, sorry, this is first one is just a times 1, second one is b times t, third one is c e to the minus t. That still raises the question, what are a, b, and c? Well, that's where we actually have to do the partial fractions manually. So let's go ahead to do that. We will get this fraction. Let's do some cross multiplications, one way or another. Here I am expanding and simplifying in a relatively straightforward manner. And something interesting happens over here. Well, what's the constant term? The constant term is b. So therefore, we can conclude that b equals to 1. How many s's do we have here? Well, none, right? How many s's do we have here? a plus b. So a plus b s means that there is no s. That means that a plus b must be 0. Since b is 1, a is negative b, which is, which is negative 1, yeah. Finally, how many s squares do we have here? None. So, how many s squares do we have here? a plus c. This means that a plus c must equal 0 as well. c equals to minus a which is net minus, minus 1, neg negative of negative 1. So that's just positive 1. We 
which means that we can actually write this down as minus 1 plus t plus e to the minus t. And to answer our question, we need to write this, replace all the t's with t minus 2's. Perhaps we can do some simplifications. And that is how we do it. That's all. So it's a relatively straightforward process. It takes a bit of effort, but entirely doable. I like to joke with my students that at this point in time, I would just leave the exam hall uh, and go for my holiday, but it's fine, it's fine. Okay, we are going to attempt this last question, which takes a bit of effort, but it's not as bad as it seems. We need to calculate the Fourier series of this particular function, the absolute value of the cosine of t. So this is the last topic in this course, and it can get a little tedious. I'm going to show you guys how I do it. Uh, there will be some integrations. Buckle up your seatbelts. It's going to be fun. So the first thing to consider is, well, what is the period of this function? What is the period? To do that, we can sketch this graph. Y. We are taking the absolute value of the cosine function, so let's first draw the cosine function. It doesn't need to be a perfect drawing, it just needs to be enough to help you figure out what's going on. As you can see, it's not a perfect drawing, uh, but roughly speaking, we know that this and this should be 1 and negative 1 respectively. So what does that look like for our purposes? The idea here is that we are taking the absolute value, which means that any time the function goes underneath, we're going to need to flip it. So any section, which is green, we, is the section that remains the same. And the blue sections are being flipped. Now what that means is that the period is not just 2 pi anymore. In the original graph, you're going to get a period of 2 pi. All right, this is going to be pi, this is going to be negative pi. But in this new graph, the repetition happens at a much shorter length. It's going to happen at a repetition of pi. So that's going to change our formulas just a little bit. And we can actually go ahead and write down these formulas. Right? So we can write down uh, the formulas for the Fourier coefficients. And we aim to calculate these formulas with a little bit of integration, if, if, it, if it's feasible. Uh, and hopefully, we can take advantage of some things. Now, it's interesting to note that this, when you reflect it about the y-axis, you get the same graph. In other words, we know that f is even. We call this an even function when you can do the flip, and we call it an odd function if you can rotate it around. Now what that means is that something nice will happen later with the calculations because of the properties of even functions. For now, let's just write out the formulas of the Fourier coefficients. If you've done a little bit of linear algebra, you would know that this is related to the inner product. If you've not done any linear algebra, don't worry about it, all is well. Let's contextualize the formulas for this, uh, these Fourier coefficients. So this will be 2 over pi. Integral of the period divided by 2, so symmetrically. For a n, it will be almost the same, except that we're going to add the cosine term. And if I recall correctly, this would be 2 pi 
t divided by the period. I believe I'm missing a term. 2 pi n t divided by the period. Okay, that's, that's a lot more accurate there. And for the bn term, we get the same thing. Except that instead of a cosine, we are going to replace it with a sine. Of course, um, the pi's cancel out, but something even more interesting happens. We know that f of t is what we call an even function, but sine of t, which looks a little bit like this, whoops, let's just draw it quickly here. The sine function actually rotates about the origin, which means that the sine function is an odd function. When you multiply an even function by an odd function, the result is an odd function. If the result is an odd function, the integral that's symmetric about the origin would always equal zero automatically. No other work needed. No other work needed. That's, that's pretty cool. Now, for these terms, we need to do a little bit more effort. It's not as bad as it seems. Um, these are what we call even functions. This is an even function. So we can make one simplification, which is to take this integral, replace the bottom with a 0, multiply everything with a 2. So this would give us 4 over pi f of t dt. Likewise, we can do with this because this is an even function multiplied by another even function so the total is just another even function that is um, 4 over pi that is how we do it all right now it boils down to actually just calculating these integrals and we want to recall that oops, that f of t is the modulus of cosine of t, which on this region, if you look carefully, actually follows the original shape, which means that the absolute value of cosine of t, well, that is just basically cosine of t, because we didn't do any flipping. So let's go ahead to calculate a naught. And the integral of cosine of t is a rather straightforward calculation. That is just the sine of t. To evaluate this integral, we will plug in the endpoints. And we recall that the sine of 0 is just 0, the sine of pi over 2 is just 1, the result is simply 4 over pi. Now for a n, we do a very similar approach. But this time we need to worry a little bit about the cosine 2 n t. Thankfully, we do have a formula to describe this result. We can use what we call the product to sum formula. I'm actually not sure what the name is. All right, but it's going to look a bit like this. It's going to be half of something interesting, something in something that we can integrate. It would be the cosine of something plus the cosine of some other thing. What are the two things? The first one is the bigger term plus the smaller term. And the second term is the bigger term minus the second term. This looks correct. Let me stare at this for a moment. Yeah, this looks fine. Yeah, this this looks this looks alright. Yeah, this looks this looks this looks true. 
All right. And what does that result for us? Well, <laughs> that actually works out very nicely. All right, here's why. We could bring the half out so everything becomes just two over here. And the integral of cosine is sine once again. The integration here is not as crazy as it seems. Of course, we need to do a little bit of bookkeeping. So we have the factor 2n plus 1. And for the chain rule, to account for that, we need to divide everything by 2n plus 1. Likewise with the second term. Oops. I'll let you check that when you substitute t equals to 0, the whole thing simplifies to just 0. And for t equals to pi over 2, we need to do a little bit of work. Just a little bit. That's just by substituting t equals to pi over 2. Just substitute these guys in this manner. And what's the what's the catch to this to this question? Well, we could do some expansions. Let's just maybe do the expansions separately over here. You can use the sine expansion formula. So this will become sine of n pi cosine of half pi plus cosine of n pi sine of half pi. If you change this to a minus sign, then the whole thing becomes a minus sign. Uh, something interesting happens because cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So the whole thing over here just goes to 0. In fact, sine of an integer multiple of pi is 0 as well. Cosine of n pi has a nice formula. Sine of half pi is 1. And cosine of n pi uh, is a nice formula. It's minus 1 to the n. You can try to convince yourself using the cosine graph as to why this is the case. There are two useful results to think about, and that is the fact that sine of n pi is always 0, and cosine of n pi is minus 1 to the n. It's a really useful result, it's very handy, it helps you sort of consolidate ideas in a relatively straightforward manner. Now what that means is that the first term corresponds to the plus situation, so that would simplify to uh, minus 1 to the n over 2n plus 1. The second expression here would correspond to the minus situation, which means that would be minus of minus 1 to the n over 2n minus 1. So we have a naught. A n and B n. This gives us the Fourier series as follows. A naught over 2 plus a summation of k1 to infinity of A n multiplied by cosine of 2nt plus bn times a bunch of signs. But bn is all zero, so that's basically it. Let's write this, let's contextualize this as mod of cosine of t. There we go. So that's how we calculate the Fourier series. Took a little more effort than the others, but it boils down fundamentally to using integration techniques. It's really interesting. 
Now we want to therefore find the value of this infinite series and usually what that looks like is by substituting a value of t. Uh, how I like to think about this is I try to sub in t equals to 0 in both sides. I try to sub in t equals to 0 and hope for the best. Uh, so that's what we're going to try to do now. On the left side, you get the modulus of cosine of 0, so that's just 1. On the right side, you get a 2 plus pi. And the right side, all the cosines become 1s as well. Ideally, what we have on the right side ends up being the same thing as the question. That's, that's the general idea. Somehow, you know, the right side should simplify to the question. And then we get the answer for free. It's a really cool technique to evaluate strange infinite sums. Now, what does that look like for us? Well, I noticed the minus 1 over n is common. So we let's pull that out and let's pull this guy out as well. Let's pull out the 2 over pi. I believe this is not k equals to 1, this should be n equals to 1. And let's pull the minus 1 to the n as well. Let's maybe do some simplifications, hopefully things work out over here. And over here, if we do the cross multiplication, we are going to get. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna. I wanted to try to do this mentally, but I don't have the brain capacity for this. It is currently 2 15 a.m. I'm exhausted, but it's worth it. So let's uh, do that. Two ends cancel, that's for sure. And we're left with a minus two over here. On the bottom, we get an expression of the form a plus b, a minus b, which simplifies to a squared minus b squared. So I'm going to write it down that way. Right, and finally, uh, we can pull out um, a 2. We can pull out a 2. I'm going to combine the minus signs. So that this minus sign and this whole thing combines to give me minus 1 to the n plus 1 times 1 over 2n all squared minus 1. So that's sort of what's happening there. Now, something interesting happens um, over here. And that is the fact that this actually ends up being this same infinite series. Why is that the case? Well, let me just illustrate. This is going to be when n equals to 1, the first term is 1 over 2 squared minus 1. That's when you substitute n equals to 1 into these guys. And when you substitute n equals to 2, you can get minus 1 over 4 squared minus 1. And that should look a little familiar. Plus 1 over 6 squared minus 1, minus 1 over 8 squared plus 1, so on and so forth. So that's that's actually the ticket to solve this question. We're almost there. We're actually almost there. To handle this question, let's just do some algebra. So this summation, which is what we're interested in, when all the dust settles with a little bit of algebra, this will equal 1 minus 2 over pi, multiplied by pi over 4. So on the right side, we get the sum that we're interested in.
And on the left side, we get um, pi over 4 minus half. That is precisely the sum that we are interested in. And that is the Fourier series question for this math course. Took a little bit more effort than all the others. And hopefully that helps you guys revise and, well, learn what needs to be learned in order to either pass the exam or, God willing, even ace the exam. If you liked this video, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Share this with your peers. Let them know that doing a uh, math uh, paper at the polytechnic level is not as crazy as people make it out to be.